Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, April's happy hour tour of the Alphon Collection of Contemporary Art. We're going to just wait about another minute or so to let people trickle in, and then we'll get started. But while we're waiting, if you want to go ahead and tell us if you enjoyed watching the uh, cocktail demo video, um, if it looks good to you, if you're going to try it at home, or uh, what kind of recipes you'd like to see, you can go free, free, uh, feel free to share that in the comments uh, box below. All right, we're just going to give it a couple more seconds, but as you're joining us, um, if this is your first happy hour tour, welcome. It's the uh, penultimate before we take a break for the summer, so you'll have another chance to try a new drink and listen to some art talk in the beginning of May. Um, but you can also share in the comments anything you might be drinking that maybe isn't uh, the cocktail that we demoed in just a second. But let's see. But I think we're good to get started. Um, so let's just pull up our PowerPoint really quick so that we can start with some, some artwork. All right, so welcome, welcome. So for April, because we are officially in national uh, book week, we decided to have the theme of books and reading and literature uh, in honor of uh, said week. So I was pleasantly surprised to find how many pieces of work in the Alphon collection are related to either books or narratives or um, just stories with which we've grown up. And so I'm going to share the work of three different artists today all of which are quickly becoming um, part of my list of favorites, but that's that's a big list if you know me. Um, I can't decide, it's like picking children. But we're gonna start with the work of Richard Baker. And so Richard Baker is a, a still life artist. Uh, and still life, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, uh, means that you're you're looking at objects in life, inanimate objects, and you're capturing them in great detail. So as you can see from these two works, and we're going to be looking at four in total by this artist, they are hyper realistic, right? So it's it's hard to tell if you're actually looking at a book or at an image of a book or at a painting of a book. In this case, um, they are paintings and they're made with gouache, which is a type of uh, really a uh, translucent paint somewhere between an oil paint and a watercolor, which gives uh, great versatility to, to, your, uh, to, your, to your canvas in terms of creating uh, tones. So it's a great medium. And so with his still lifes, and, and I'm not gonna lie, I, I totally fell for it. I, um, the first time I saw these, I wasn't, I wasn't familiar with the artist at the time. And it took me, I don't know, maybe five or six looks through our catalog of contemporary art. And I was like, are these just photographs of books? Is is he a bookmaker? But he's, it, it took me a second. I should have started by looking at the medium. Um, but in any case, the reason that they are so incredibly hard to identify, whether it's, you know, a photograph of a book or an actual painting is because he uses a, a technique called trompe l'oeil, which is a French term that means um, to trick the eye or to, de to deceive the eye. And trompe l'oeil has been around for a really long time. If, if you're not familiar with the term, I guarantee you've seen it either in a book or at a museum. Um, the Renaissance is well associated with it and you see it a lot during that time period in ceiling paintings where it would feel like if you looked up, you're looking at the sky rather than the interior of a, an architectural space. 
but then it reached new heights during the 17th century and Dutch painting, in which case it uh, became this incredible act of virtuosity, which to an extent it always had been. Um, but then it starts to go beyond ceilings and you see it being really uh, cleverly used um, in, in objects where it becomes really hard to know if you're looking at a three-dimensional object or a painting. Um, and so ironically, 17th century Dutch art is also well known for still lives. So we can see there that Richard Baker is in dialogue with a, a much larger history that transcends our contemporary moment. Um, so obviously the, the theme of books here has to do with the subjects that we're looking at. Um, but it also, if we think of books in terms of narrative, uh, this, these particular, these four particular works that we're looking at, and we actually have a lot more than four, but these are the four that I'm going to focus on today, have a really fun story of their own, which I'll get to in just a second. But if we look at his treatment of these books, uh, they are what we can call careworn. And I think that really just shows his, um, his interest in books past the fact that they're just books, but really looking them, looking at them as, as these uh, objects of value. It's a way of uh, seeing not just the book as object, but the book as having a life of its own and helping, or rather being included in the life of its owner. So it's this, uh, this lovely relationship that goes both ways. So on one end, if we think of books and how they've helped to shape our personalities, they kind of feel like old friends, right? They transcend being objects and they become these um, physical markers of experiences, these, um, these benchmarks of specific moments or time periods that we look at and that we sometimes identify as uh, foundational to uh, you know, shaping our personality. And it goes both ways, right? Because in the same way that they are a part of us as people, we become a part of them. And that's something that he really strives to capture in the way that he depicts these books. As you can tell, these are not, these look like they're in pretty good shape. But if we, I'm going to go over to the next slide, we see these, these are, these are careworn and well-loved, right? So we see it in the fraying. I mean, this one's just being held together by a rubber band, which I love uh, because, you know, you can tell this has been read and considering the work, specifically the work that it is, which is the portable Nietzsche, um, that, that makes sense to me. <laughs> you would have to read that many times to understand it and to really internalize it. Um, but here we see it in Portrait of a Lady as well. And so all the little uh, tears and the folded edges and annotations inside, which I feel, especially with this one, I feel that this would be full of annotations. We see the little bookmark there, not the bookmark, the page marker. Um, and so it captures the person's uh, residue and its contribution to the life of the book. So that relationship. Now, um, as I said, this project or these, these pieces have a great story past just the narratives that we're seeing here. And so um, Richard Baker was actually commissioned by the Alphand um, to add very specific works to the collection. And the way that they identified which books to include, and there's, I mean, at least eight that I can think of, there might be more, um, but I will, I will count them when we're done talking and I'll put them in the, in the, in the chat for you guys to, to know, or, you know, invite you to go explore our website and see how many you find in our collection. But this was actually a commission in which professors in the faculty at Rollins were invited to share um, some of the books that helped, you know, make uh, make an imprint on who they were and helped shape their perspectives. And they could kind of be considered essential to not just their academic life, but also to their emotional and personal life. And so these are just some of the books that our faculty members select. And I'll go back to look at these two again. Um, and so they submitted their actual book copy to Richard Baker and he he captured its likeness as if it was a portrait. So it's it's not it's 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 a still life per se, but it's also kind of a portrait, not just of the book, but of the faculty member. And so 
you know, this one, whoever this faculty member was actually did have a rubber band. And, you know, this was obviously a, a well-used companion copy for them. I keep going back to that one. I really love it. Um, I feel like a lot of my books look like that. Um, but if we go past that story, which, which is a great one, it really helps us understand how Richard Baker looks at books, right? Um, he augments the, this tactile experience of looking at a still life and looking at the physicality of this object um, and makes it almost qualitative and experiential um, to, to look at it, how it's um, contributing to the viewer and to the person who, in this case, faculty members who gave it. So in the chat, I would love to hear if there's a book that was really foundational to you as a person um, or as a scholar uh, that you would have submitted for this project. I would love to know what it is and you can put that in the chat. Um, for me personally, I feel like, you know, five-year-old me would have said The Giving Tree because I feel, I feel like that had a big part in developing um, my understanding of kindness and compassion. But then uh, as I grow older, I feel like little women would have made the cut. And then um, probably mm, Fair Warning by Robert Owen Butler had a, a big role in shaping my interest in, uh, in art and um, the history of objects and how they, how they exist in our world. Um, if you haven't read that book, it's, it's a really good one. All, all three of those are good ones. Um, but yes, please do share the ones that, that mean something to you and that had stuck with you and, and maybe look like this copy of Nietzsche uh, with us in the chat. I'm, I'm happy to hear. So the next art, artist we're going to be looking at, another of my favorites, is Abelardo Morel. He is a Cuban artist, uh, born in Cuba, raised, uh, spent most of spent most of his time in the U.S., is now a Boston-based photographer. Um, and photography is his life and medium um, across across the board, uh, which speaks to me as a as a as a as a historian of history of photography specifically uh, and and I and a lover of the manual camera and stepping outside of the digital arena of photography, which uh, uh, Morel does beautifully. So we're going to look at a couple of different works by him that um, employ this theme of books, but in different capacities to show how it has become a bit of a versatile theme, um, depending on which series of his work we are looking at. And so a little bit about him, as I mentioned before, he's, he's a lover of the manual camera, and he takes a little bit further than that. He loves, uh, and his work is almost a love letter to old uh, methods of printing and of taking photographs outside of Photoshop and outside of the digital revolution, uh, where, which I feel like most artists, most photographers, you know, strove in that direction and tried to figure out the mechanics of that. But Morel went in a different direction. Um, and so we see a revival of all these old processes, 19th century processes. And so while not featured in any of the works we're looking at today, um, he kind of got a start and really um, started approaching photography as this experimental medium with his um, camera obscura works. So we're gonna unpack a couple of terms there. Um, number one, camera obscura. You might have heard that term, but not sure what it is, or vice versa. You might know what it is, but not know what it's called. And so to, to paint a picture, uh, a camera obscura literally is Latin for darkened room. And so it was, it's been around for, you know, a really, really long time. I would say there's, there's uh, evidence of versions of it existing uh, as early as, you know, the Renaissance, probably even slightly before. But what it is, is a think of being in a room and closing, not just closing your windows, but literally tarping them off because you need to eliminate any source of light. But there is one hole within this darkened space which serves as your aperture. So it's it's the one hole through which you let light in, and depending on the size of the hole will be you know the quality of the image. But what basically happens is that hole serves as a lens. And inside the completely pitch black room, 
anything that is happening outside or any, think of like nature, but think of it as an image, right? Of like a projection that's happening outside of this room, this camera obscura will be reflected on the inside flipped, right? Because that hole is serving as a lens. And so basically what it does, it's an analog way of replicating the mechanics of a camera or what would then later become a camera uh, towards the uh, end of the 19th century. If you've ever used a pinhole camera, that is a, a version of a camera obscura, a more um, handmade version, but it's the same concept, a completely enclosed darkened space with a single hole to allow light in through um, to the interior. And so Morel started playing with this and turned his house into a camera obscura, which I have actually done. I did that in college because my first degree was in um, studio art, uh, specifically photography. And one of our um, uh, BFA workshops were to turn our, our professor's house into a camera obscura. And you could see they're upside down again, but uh, you could see people that were walking along the streets in the neighborhood reflected in, in the dining room, which was really fine. And so this is a technique that Morel hadn't really seen before. And what he did was he didn't just experience it, but he had a camera in there with him and he left his shutter speed open um, to capture these images. So these are long exposures. And that just means that your shutter speed or how long light, the speed at which light enters the film um, is much longer than if you just did like a, an instant click and then it's it's a much uh, slower shutter, a faster shutter speed rather. Um, and so he photo he started by photographing the interior. So you have images of his bedroom or his living room with um, with the world outside reflected inside. And he's done it with um, tents. That one of the first pieces by Morel I actually saw was uh, it's the floor. So think of ground floor leaves grass of uh, of a tent, and he has turned the tent into a camera obscura. And so what we see is an, a photograph of the floor, but you also see the tarping and the detail. So you're not really sure when you first look at it what you're what you're seeing until you take some time to to deeply look. Um, and when he started just using a instead of using just an opening, he started to apply a lens, as we would with a camera. He started getting a march a much sharper uh, projection onto his walls. But that really lays the groundwork for how he experiences photography and how he thinks about it. Because at the end of the day, there is a technical element to photography that, um, if you're a science nerd like me, really speaks to you and becomes not just about the content being produced, but about the process of its production. And talking a little bit about how his experimentation early on with Camera Obscura would later factor in to this series. And so after becoming a new father, he was really interested in exploring this new chapter and how to interpret that in a different way that didn't feel too far divorced from what he was working on up until that point, which was a, temp a period of street photography where he was looking at um, just leading contemporaries in his time. And so with this childhood series, he captures images of his children, of objects related to childhood, such as broken toys and crayons um, and storybooks, a lot of them as macro shots. And it's really a way of him um, experimenting to a degree with, within his process, but also he credits this as a, a moment of, of stillness and of reflection where he was able to kind of take a step back and just allow an organic process to happen. And through it, um, and because some of his shots are so long, uh, he would capture his children sleeping. And just like what we talked about with the camera obscura, leave his shutter speed open. It allowed him to really think through his motivations, his the themes that he was capturing. And he says that the work that he did during this series and during this period of his life um, became this almost DNA, this, this uh, biological um, code that we see permeate throughout his work later on. So it all kind of, it was a new way of looking at the world and looking at life. 
and really stopping. And there's a stillness to his work and looking at the objects and how they uh, can be transformed past our understanding of, say, this storybook. And we see that to new heights with his next series, um, which is his book series, which is part of all of these are part of our collection, obviously. Uh, but this one handles books a little differently. So he um, he expresses that he was looking at a book by El Greco, who is a Spanish artist. Um, I'm talking like old Western uh, from like the, the Western canon, the old masters. And um, he's looking at this book and the way that suddenly the light came in through the window and gleamed on the surface of this and kind of uh, turned it into this iridescent um, surface made him uh, understand the physicality of differently all of a sudden. And he had appreciated their architectural form, uh, their feel, their smell, everything beyond the narrative in addition to the narrative. And so he spent a long time, and these are just two from a much larger series, where he's looking at the interplay of light on pages, of um, light on gilded edging, of the structure of spine, and in scientific uh, exploration and curiosity with, with objects and materials and to what limit uh, pushed. And so this, this last series by Morel that we're gonna look at in terms of books is uh, his Alice in Wonderland series. And this is one that he did in 1998 originally, but actually revisited in 2020 during the pandemic. And so the original version is really just taking uh, this narrative by Lewis Carroll and using the original illustrations and creating a landscape that is all books. So I know we're only looking at one here, but if you look at his much larger series, we don't have the entire series, but I do encourage you to look at it. Um, and when we're done, I will share his website with you in the chat so that you can see um, some of his uh, remakes from 2020. But they're all about understanding the narrative of Alice in Wonderland and how this this deep dive into another world is kind of similar and mimicked in the process of deep diving into a book, into a narrative. And so he literally uses book pages as part of the landscape, as part of the background for these little sets that he makes in photographs. So here we're looking at Drink Me from 1998, which is the famous scene where Alice is uh, drinking the potion and shrinking and then getting really big again. Um, to go through, I think it's like a small door. I can't remember. It's been a while since I read the original. Um, but interestingly, we also have the, the one from 2020, this series again, but through the second volume, which would be through the looking glass. And so he just never got around to it. But then after when COVID hit, he actually caught COVID pretty early on in the pandemic. And after luckily pulling through, um, he was, you know, forced to self-quarantine and then went into what has been a year of just epic bizarreness and unparalleled experiences. And so he started feeling these themes come through in our, you know, in our, in our daily experience that are seen in Through the Looking Glass with this topsy-turvy world, right? It's familiar, but it's completely new and foreign at the same time. Uh, kind of like Stranger Things, right? The, I can't remember what you call that other world, but the upside down. That's kind of the parallel reality that we're living. And so he felt it was a good time to revisit and and create that second series. And so some of the work that he looked at from 1998, he felt didn't quite hold um, and didn't translate as well. Um, later is that math on the spot is not my strong suit, but many years later, um, 20, 23, I'm gonna say, years later. And so some of them he redid, but some of them he didn't. So an interesting exploration that thinks that, uh, that looks at current moment in relation to uh, narratives with which we grew up um, that kind of examine uh, this, this bizarre ex existence. But I should mention that, you know, in both Alice in Wonderland and then through the looking glass, and it's something that he touches on, uh, Alice has this resilience, right? She, she, she's in a very strange place. She's uncomfortable. She's out of her element, but she perseveres and she sees it through and, while she doesn't um, accept these irregularities, she gets she gets through them and she copes with them, and that's really um, it's pretty uh, a pretty timely and topical message um, to us today. And so, before I lose you guys again, I'm going to move on to the last artist that we're going to be looking at today, and 
Um, I will tell you, this, art, this artist, Amy Selman, will be featured in one of our exhibitions this summer um, at the, uh, uh, the Cornell Museum. So I do invite you to look at it, uh, mostly because it's actually a video. And um, I, I wasn't planning on even testing the fates by trying to um, stream this live. And I'm glad I didn't, considering everything that just happened. Um, but I, I do hope that this is an invitation for you to come see it uh, once it's up in May. But Amy Silman's piece actually looks at the work um, Metamorphosis by Ovid, which is a, an epic narrative uh, poem from the year 8 CE, uh, which would be AD now, understanding. Um, and so uh, every 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 uh, Greek or Roman myth occurred is actually to an extent woven into metamorphosis, and that's part of how it's um, how we read it, right? It's it's these stories that are all interconnected, and there's a an element of one narrative transforming into the next. And so this piece kind of takes that idea and turns it into a process. And what we have is um, her creating these overlapped abstract images alongside iPad sketches that play in, a, it's like a five or yeah, five minute loop that just keeps playing. So it's the cyclical narrative, uh, but one story blends into the other in this really abstract visual way with a frenzied energy. So you, you have to sit there and look through, watch it a couple times to kind of pick up all the stories, but we see very, um, we see very specific characters that we might recognize and I have a couple stills here of three of, and these are like up for a millisecond uh, before it switches into something else. And that's that's important to the stories because one of the main themes throughout Metamorphosis is this constant uh, transformation of people into either animals or inanimate objects out of vengeance, but sometimes rewarded by the gods. And so these three stills that I've chosen to include on the uh, left top, top left, we have this spider, which we might be familiar with. Um, this is the story of Arachne, and Arachne is um, a weaver, and she's she's quite good. And she is challenged by uh, Minerva, and I'm using the Roman names, but if we're thinking Greek, it would be Athena, the goddess of wisdom, um, to compete against her in this tapestry weaving contest. And so, uh, Minerva creates this beautiful tapestry that has. Uh, images that kind of exalt the gods, right? It kind of glorifies them and attests to all their all their feats and all their, all their creation, and it pleases them. Um, but then Arachne, who as a human has a very different experience to the gods, it's a very different, it's the antithesis of what Minerva or what Athena created. And so it's, it's, it's mocking in a sense, but it's really just complete transparency. And shows the fact that they rape humans and that they, um, you know, in, engage in these horribly cruel acts um, against mankind. And so obviously this enrages Athena, goddess herself, um, Minerva, whichever way you want to go. And um, she, as well, there's many versions of the story, but the one that sticks the most is that she takes a, a wooden stick or a, a piece of this loom that, uh, that they were using and basically beats Arachne to the point where she is in so much pain that she commits suicide. And so taking pity on what she's done, and to a degree, she's actually just uh, done exactly what, uh, what Arachne accused her of, or, or rather accused the gods of in her tapestry. She um, takes pity and turns, brings Arachne back from the dead as a spider so that she can spend her days doing her favorite thing, which is weaving. Uh, not looms anymore, spider webs, but uh, if we think about, you know, the core of the word arachnophobia, arachnophobia, it comes from arachne. So there's a correlation there. They're all uh, stills from the Amy Selman piece, which you will be able to see on view. Um, thank goodness, not virtually, um, in the museum this summer. But really just kind of highlights that transformative element of all the different mythologic stories with which you grew up. Uh, and how within the text of um, Ovid's Metamorphosis, they all blend into one another. Uh, and she has done so by, by her, um, the aesthetic and the design choices that she's made to kind of turn them into this um, abstract, but also slightly figural uh, composition that loops around.
So that's that's all that I have for you. Um, again, sorry for all the interruptions and for the technical difficulties, but thank you so much for, for your patience and for sticking with us if you're still with us. Um, and if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, and I'll, I'll give you, I'll give us a minute to, to allow you to do that. And if, if, if there's no questions, uh, then I invite you all to join us, hopefully with, with no issues uh, next, mon next month in May for our uh, last uh, Alphon Happy Hour Tour before we take a break for the summer. And that will be on, I believe, uh, May 5th. And um, until then, I, have a, I hope you guys have a great evening and check our website for upcoming virtual programs. Thank you and have a good night.